Today's lecture is regarding the diabetes mellitus, which is basically a metabolic syndrome. And we're going to discuss the definitions along with its types, and we're going to detail the pathophysiology that is underlying the major types of diabetes mellitus in this lecture. Now, in simple words, uh, diabetes mellitus in a layman language is also known as sugar diabetes. Now, to get to the core knowledge of diabetes mellitus, it's basically when the body cannot use glucose normally. Glucose is basically the main major source of energy from the body's cells. And when it is not utilized in a proper way, the person can basically suffer from hyperglycemia. And this word is basically indicating the increased amounts of glucose that are running in the body. But we all know that to pass exams and to score good in exams, it's always very important to define the medical terms in a proper way. So by definition, diabetes mellitus is a group of metabolic diseases characterized by hyperglycemia, which is the raised levels of sugars in the blood, resulting from defects in the insulin secretion, which was the major hormone, the modulating hormone, insulin actions, or it can be both. The pathophysiology, which is basically affecting the secretion as well as the actions of the insulin, they can affect the glucose levels in a person. So I was just wondering where the word diabetes came from. And I found out that diabetes mellitus is derived from a Greek word. Diabetes meaning siphon, which means to pass through. And the Latin word mellitus means honeyed or sweet. So this is quite interesting when you relate the medical terms from, with their origins. This is because in diabetes, excess sugar is found in the blood as well as in the urine. So it's very important for you people to remember this fact that diabetes can be diagnosed through the blood levels as well as the glucose levels in the urine. This is how it gets its peculiar name as well. So it's quite interesting, you know. If you look at pancreas as an organ, it is present in the abdomen almost in the left upper quadrant. It has exocrine as well as endocrine functions. The exocrine function of the pancreas is to release the pancreatic juices for the purpose of digestion. And the endocrine function is to release different hormones, majorly the insulin. And then we have some other hormones such as somatostatin, glucagon, and gastrin that are also released from the endocrine portion of the pancreas. If we look closely at the histological features of the pancreas, we have the islets of Langerhans that are basically the island of cells that are surrounded by the supporting cells from all the other sides. Now, if we study these islets of Langerhans in details, you can see over here that we have the alpha cells, the delta cells, and primarily and most importantly, we have the beta cells located in the islet of Langerhans. Now, these beta cells are basically responsible for the release of insulin. And insulin, we all know, is the major modulator that is required for the uh, control of the glucose in our bodies that we're going to study what are the major functions of insulin and how does it basically affect the glucose metabolism. But for now, you have to remember that the fate of the insulin is to enter the hodal circulation and it is going to majorly affect the metabolism of glucose inside the liver. So for now, focus on these facts that insulin is getting released from the beta cells, from the pancreatic islets, and after secretion, it is going to enter the portal circulation and is carried to the liver, which is its prime target organ. Now, insulin has two major actions to perform in the fasting states 
as well as in the postprandial states, which is going to differ quite a lot. In fasting state, insulin secretions are low and it acts mainly as a hepatic hormone, modulating the glucose production from the liver. In the postprandial state, insulin concentrations are high and it then suppresses the glucose production from the liver and promotes the entry of glucose into the peripheral tissues. So remember these two major primary actions of the insulin and how it is going to differ in its actions in different states. So it is quite intelligent enough to know how it is going to act in different scenarios. So for now, we are done with the different actions of the insulin and now we are going to move forward. What is going to go wrong in these particular actions of insulin that is going to ultimately result in diabetes mellitus in these particular patients.